Well, good morning. morning. All right, it sounds like somebody had their coffee this morning. I know I had my half cup of coffee this morning. It's the way I sort of start off my day. It needs to be a hot cup of coffee though, right? I mean, if it's not hot, you probably don't want it. Nobody wants lukewarm a cup of coffee in the morning. Uh, There's a lot of things that you probably don't want unless it's either hot or either cold, like maybe some, some tea. You know, if somebody came to you and said, hey, man, I've got some good tea for you, but, but they gave it to you like this, and you're like, well, where's the ice cubes in it? Nobody likes tea unless it's hot or either cold. You want to see some ice cubes in that before that becomes refreshing to you. You're like, I think I'll pass on that, right? There's other things that you might eat or, or drink that you know that you won't really enjoy unless it's either hot or cold. So for example, maybe a a slice of pizza. Maybe you showed up late to a party, and when you got to the party, uh, there was this slice of pizza that's there, and and you're like, hold on. (laughs) That's been sitting out for a couple hours. I think I'll pass, right? Nobody really likes a lukewarm slice of pizza. Even many of us have gone to restaurants. So you get to a restaurant and they come out with some French fries, right? And they come out and you're like, oh man, we got some good French fries here for you. And you're excited and then you taste it. And it's cold, you know? The first thing you're going to say is, okay, the French fries have to go back, okay? You need to get us a fresh uh, batch of French fries because nobody eats cold. Now, it's not really cold, right? It's not ice cold but it's lukewarm, doesn't taste the same unless it's piping hot. There's another thing that we don't really enjoy unless it's hot, and that is our relationship. Nobody likes a lukewarm relationship. You know, the reality is is that if you're in a relationship and there's no genuine affection or really any type of excitement to really get to connect to each other, to really get to know each other, to listen to all your aspirations, goals, and dreams, that relationship would be characterized as lukewarm. When we go through the scriptures, we find in the scriptures that Jesus is not some abstract figure. He's a person with real emotions. He expresses a wide range of emotions as well. There's times where he openly wept. There's times where he felt compassionate about a person. There's other times where he exemplified righteous anger. But there's one feeling that Jesus had that none of us really like to have either. And that is this feeling of wanting to vomit, to throw up, to feel sick so that you might want to puke or whatever word you call it, right? Nobody likes that feeling. Unfortunately, that was the description that Jesus gave to the church at Laodicea, a church that made him want to vomit. I can surmise that each of you are here today because you want to get closer in your relationship with God. That's why you are tuning in right now online, because somehow in this time frame that we have together, you're hoping that it might bring you closer to God, that your relationship with him would become uh, stronger. Well, here's the good news is that God's desire is to be close to you. And he's given us some instructions on how we might be able to, to light the fire in our relationship with him. And so today I want to share with you a message that I've entitled, Don't Make God Sick. Yeah, don't make God sick. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, for your word. God, we ask that you would use the text today to help us to go through this letter and see ourselves in it. God, let this message heat up our relationship with you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. So many of you have been following along with us in this series on the seven letters to the churches in Asia Minor. If you haven't, I'll just give you a quick background. Jesus comes and he meets the Apostle John while he's exiled on the island of Patmos. And he gives John the instructions to write 
seven distinct letters to churches that are in Asia Minor. Jesus shares these valuable insights to the seven churches that are in this area. And the insights are there not to crush the church, but they're there so that the church might see what God sees, that ultimately these churches would live up to their full potential. And so he writes these letters, and today we're going to look at the final letter that he writes to the church at Laodiceus. Let's take a look at it in Revelations chapter 3. We'll start at verse 14. Verse 14 says, write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. I'll stop there. So the city of Laodicea, who was located on the Lycus River Valley, I think I have a picture or a map of it there, it's strategically located where three roads actually met together. And if you can look closely, there's this dotted line where you see Laodicea, and there's three roads that would converge, which made this a highly commercialized and wealthy city. There were wealthy people who lived there. There were financiers that uh, financed a lot of the upgrades in the city. These wealthy tycoons would build these theaters, these huge stadiums. They would build these lavish public baths and fabulous shopping centers. This was the place to be. In 60 AD, the city of Laodicea experienced a major earthquake. Much of the city was destroyed. But because of their resilience, their resourcefulness, and also their financial stability, they were able to quickly rebound, rebuild, without any type of support or bailout for, from the city of Rome. So they were able to kind of pull this off themselves. Laodiceus was also known for manufacturing uh, this special kind of black wool. They were able to breed a special kind of sheep that would grow black wool. So they would now manufacture these, uh, this wool so that they would create different um, wardrobes, also different tunics, and have these tunics and wardrobes exported throughout the region. The city of Laodiceus was known for having excellent medicine as well. They had this specific uh, ointment or a salve that they use to help treat eye irritations like swelling of the eye or irritations of the eye to help people see better. So people would come from all over to this one city to actually get this eye salve. Today, if you wanted to live with the lifestyle of the rich and the famous, you would probably go to a place like Beverly Hills, maybe the Hamptons, or a place called Fisher Island off the coast of Miami. But back then... If you wanted to live with the rich and famous, you wanted to go to a place called Laodiceus. Yeah, this was the place to be. But they had one thing that was a problem. There was one inadequacy about this city, and that was that this city did not have, not have its own water source. They actually had to bring in water from neighboring towns of Heropolis and Colossae. So they had the best engineers in the city to build these aqueducts that would take the water from Heropolis and also take the water from Colossae. Well, the water in Heropolis had these hot springs. And so the hot springs, would, water would move down into the city. And the, the water in Colossae came from the snow-capped mountains. And so this was ice-cold water. But when the water from Heropolis and Colossae would meet and get finally get to Laodiceus, the water was neither hot nor was it cold. It was lukewarm. And so this city did not have the hot springs that were soothing to the body like Heropolis. It did not have the cold, refreshing water of Colossae. This water seemed to be good for nothing. Let's take a look at verse 14. He says, write to the angel of the church in Laodicea, thus says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. In essence, he's saying, what I'm about to say is trustworthy because I am the creator of all living things. Look at verse 15. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot 
nor cold. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. He says, I know your works. Each one of the letters sort of start out with this because it's a solemn reminder that God can see beyond the outward appearance. It is God who's able to understand the true condition of mankind's heart. And so we can't hide, sort of like Adam and Eve did. God already knows. In contrast to the other six letters that he writes to this church, he has no compliment at all. He goes right into a condemnation. He says, you are neither hot nor are you cold. We're tempted to interpret the hot as being good and the cold as being bad, but that's not what he's saying here. He is saying that you are not like the refreshing cold water of Colossae. You're not like the hot water that you find in Heropolis, but you are this disgusting tasting, lukewarm water. And he says, I want to just spit you out. See, their lack of passion and their ambivalence to spiritual things caused Jesus to, be, to feel sick as if he didn't want anything to do with them. And so just like a citizen of this town of Laodicea would go to the water aqueducts and, and dip out a cup of water and sip it, it would make them sick. Verse 17, he says, for you say I'm rich. I have become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. The people in this city and the people in this church, because remember, he's talking to the church. They have an abundance of material things. They have been materially blessed. It says that they were wealthy. That means that their money was working for them and not the other way around. All of their needs seem to have been met. So any efforts that they had would really be about getting their wants. They seemed like they were living in a self-sufficient life. They felt like they had no need of the government, nor did they have any need for God. And so they begin to drift into this, what I would call satanic delusion, to believe that their money could buy their spiritual peace, their spiritual comfort, and may I even dare say their eternal security. This was a problem for this, uh, uh, at this church. The Laodiceans were guilty of self-reliance, self-righteousness, and also a spiritual uh, complacency that made Jesus sick. But that wasn't the worst thing. The worst thing was the fact that they were unaware of their condition. They had stage four carnal cancer and didn't even know it. That was the worst of the situation here, that they didn't understand their condition. People today believe that our material blessing is God's highest form of his blessings. It's easy for us to drift into thinking of that. I'm sure many of you all watch the news and they, they show you that the Powerball is up to, you know, $700 million or something, a billion dollars. In your mind, you're saying to God, if you just come through for me this one time, if you come through for me this one time, I won't ask for anything. I'll be good because if I had this, this would satisfy all of my problems, all of my situations, that everything would be okay if I could just get that. Most of us would probably not consider that we are rich. But the Apostle Paul actually talks about what's, what's the greatest blessing from God. He really does. And he explains that the greatest blessing of God is not material blessing. In Philippians chapter 3, he shares that it's not his money, it's not his status, it's not his title, it's not his job, it's not even his heritage. But he explains in Philippians chapter 3, and if you're online, you can type that in Philippians chapter 3 and just read through that chapter. You'll, say that, you'll see that he says, nothing can compare 
to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, his Savior. That is the greatest form of blessing. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, he even goes on to say that my desire is to know the power of the resurrection and that if I know Christ and I get to know him more and more, that would be the greatest blessing of all time. Like I said, most of us probably don't consider ourselves rich, but a recent study done by Yale University on global income determined that after adjusting for cost of living differences, that the typical American earns income that is 10 times more than the average person around the world. That the global median individual income is roughly $2,100 a year. Yeah. Most of the people around the world would see you as being rich that you would probably land in the top 5% of the people around the world. Truth is, is that we probably have most of our needs met. I say needs mean you have food in your stomach, clothes on your back, and a roof over your head. The reality is, is that most of us are working for our wants. We want nicer or finer clothes. We want better tasting food. We want a nicer house, maybe with a closet, a walk-in closet to can carry more of our stuff. That's the reality. Now, I'm not here to, to try to make you feel guilty. That's not my point. I just want you to begin to open up your eyes to see that God has already blessed you, and what that does is it makes you susceptible to believing the way the Laodiceans believed that they began to have sort of this apathetic attitude towards the things of God. Eh, maybe I'll go to church. Eh, maybe I'll tap in online. Eh, maybe I'll decide to give. Eh, maybe I'll decide to serve. Why don't you check back with me next month and see what my schedule looks like, and I'll see whether I can do that for you. Yeah. We are susceptible for that same type of attitude. Look at verse 18. He says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, and ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. See, Jesus now recognizes their pitiful state, and he wants them to actually begin to see it as well. The good news is, is that now he's giving us the remedy. He's actually helping them to see what the cure is for their condition. He loves us so much that he doesn't leave us in this state, but now he begins to communicate to them what they need to do. Only Christ can supply our everlasting inheritance. Only Christ can give us uh, his righteousness. Only Christ can heal us from our spiritual blindness. And this is what he says, I want you to now buy from me. Yeah, buy from me. He doesn't actually mean that we can purchase anything from God. What he's saying is that you need to get rid of your counterfeit spiritual lifestyle that you have and get something from me. You can't buy or purchase anything from God. He already has everything, but what he wants them to recognize is that they need to begin to evaluate their investment in what they were placing in the worldly things that would be temporary versus investing in what he would be able to offer that would give them everlasting results. So he's saying, I need you to buy from me. The only currency that God honors is our faith. That's what he uses for, for him to execute what he wants to do in our lives. Verse 18, he says, I advise you to buy from me gold. Refined in the fire so that you may be rich. Not just gold, but refined gold. And when he talks about gold, he's talking about tried and tested faith. We see this throughout the scriptures in the New and in the Old Testament. For Peter says that he had gone through trials and he was persecuted. But look at what he says in 1 Peter 1, 7. He says, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which through perishable is what? Refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
we see here that this gold is refined and perfected through some of the circumstances that we go in. We see this in the Old Testament. A person that suffered and really struggled was Job. And what does Job say about his suffering or what he encountered? He says in Job chapter 23, verse 10, he says, yet he knows the way I have taken. When he has tested me, I will emerge as what? Pure gold. Remember, your currency is your faith. So if you have no faith, you can't expect to receive anything from God. He's saying that you need to believe. You need to have your strength, uh, uh, your faith strengthened. So one of the cures of our spiritual lukewarmness is to pursue a life of faith. To pursue a life of faith. To the church at Laodicea had, had stopped living by faith, but now they were just living by sight. They would make decisions in their church that were safe something that they could actually shoot after and thought, well, yeah, we can do this because we've got it in the bank. They weren't willing to step out on faith. They were really, would rather do what was safe, and that was a problem. Many of you saw a couple weeks ago a short video that we did on Push the Rock. Push the Rock is a nonprofit organization uh, that we actually support uh, one of the missionaries that actually does this. And we had a great camp that ministers to kids. We teach them biblical character traits. We also, in this sports camp, share the gospel. I got the pleasure of sharing the good news. Um, we showed that video, and uh, many of you all uh, know that at the end of the camp, we had interns that would go back home. They'd start to go back into school. They'll be doing that in another couple of months. Some people that were volunteering would go back to their regular jobs. I may have a picture of, of the, the people who served in that camp, but one of the people who led that camp, you can see him in the blue shirt all the way to the right, his name is Scott. He didn't go back to another job. This was his job, and this is his job. This is what he does for a living. What you may not know is that years ago, he made this step of faith and he left a corporate job as a global executive to work for Push the Rock, nonprofit organization. What he didn't foresee, what he could not have known, is that not long after he stepped into this organization, that they would experience, or the world would experience a pandemic. And so now he had to sort of operate a nonprofit after school program for kids to learn character traits in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, this tested his faith, and no doubt, it refined him. His relationship with the Lord is even stronger because he had to trust in God through that situation. And I thank God for his example. What is it in life that you are pursuing that requires faith? Not something that you can do on your own, but something that would require God to intervene and be a part of it. What are you working on today? Look at verse 18. He says for us to buy not only this gold from him, but he says you need to buy some white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed. You can just imagine this congregation would probably show up in church sort of parading their black wool outfits no doubt they could afford polo. Ralph Lauren, the ladies had a coach bag of their day, right? They were looking good on the outside. It seemed as if they had everything that they needed. But he says, no, you need to buy some white clothes for me. The white clothes represented the, rep the, the righteousness of Christ. That's what it was. And these people were not living a righteous life. They were looking good on the outside, but the inside was rotten. We receive this righteous life by trusting in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and then we receive what's called imputed righteousness. God gives us his righteousness by faith in his works. Some of you all might remember that um, when Jesus writes to the church in Sardis, he actually explains that those who trust in Christ are actually clothed in a white robe. 
Look at what it says in Revelations chapter three, verse five. He says, in the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes, and I will never erase his name from the book of life. So those whose names were placed in this book of life are those who place their faith in Christ. They believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins, that he rose three days later with all power, and by faith in his works, one would be saved. But this is not the righteousness that he's talking about right here. Although they had received this righteousness already because, he remember, he's talking to the church. These people had already placed their faith in Christ. And so they were positionally right before God. However, their lifestyle didn't reflect it. See, there's another kind of righteousness that we need to be working toward. This is a lived out or worked righteousness that God would have us to do. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 sort of spells this out. Paul says to the church at Ephesus, For you were once, uh, once darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. See, the antidote for this hypocrisy is to pursue a life of righteousness. If you want to burn up the uh, heat up to uh, turn up the flame in your relationship with God, you need to pursue a life of faith, but also pursue a life of righteousness that you would do and live a right the right way. When I was young, I hated peas. I didn't like peas. My parents would try to coerce me into eating peas because they said it would make me strong and healthy, but it still tastes the same. It's like, no, I don't want peas. One night, my parents put peas and chicken on my plate, and I thought, oh boy, I don't like peas. I don't want to eat it. So I begin to devise a plan. Yeah. I sat at the table, and I and I said, wait a minute, let me go ahead and change my glass to a cup like this. Yeah, I went and got a cup like this. I put my ice cubes in, put my red Kool-Aid in there, set it at the table. My brother was kind of watching me because he didn't really like vegetables either. So, you know, we sat there and I started to eat. I would use my fork to transport the peas from my plate to my mouth. And then I would use my mouth to transport the peas <laughs> from my mouth into my cup, yeah. And I continued to do that until my plate was clean. My brother was watching me closely with his eyes and he was able to pick up what I was doing and he was actually amazed at my brilliance. He's like, oh. And he's like, Dad, he's got the peas in his cup. And I was like, no way. No way, he busted me, he busted me. And my dad's like, oh my goodness, what, what is going on? My dad puts peas back on my plate and he made me sit there, you know? This was sort of the lifestyle of the church that lay at the seas. They looked clean on the outside, right? It looked like they had everything going on and they would show up at church, they would show up there at their activities, but their lifestyle on the inside wasn't consistent with what God was telling them to do. God is saying, I see what's in your cup. It's not transforming your life so that it might produce real fruit. You're going through the regular uh, routines of doing church, but you're not becoming the church. You're saying there's a problem here with how you're responding. See, they had enough money to cover up their lifestyle, cover up their unrighteousness. So people would look at them and see that they were, they were okay, but God knew more. God knew that this... Word was not changing their lives. That they weren't being transformed into the image of Christ. See, God would have us to live a lifestyle where there's real transformation taking place on the inside. And sometimes the fact that we're hiding some stuff in our cup that God knows about. And he's like, this is what's causing a problem in our relationship. 
Let's take a look at verse 18. He says, not only buy some gold, not only buy some white clothing with me, but he says, I need you to buy some ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. See, this famous eye salve or ointment that they had would have no effect on the spiritual eyesight of the people at this church at Laodicea. Here Jesus says, I want you to take the ointment that I'm giving you, and this ointment will help you see. This ointment that he's talking about really reflects the anointing of the Holy Spirit for help to help us understand the scriptures so that we know the direction that we need to go in. Notice what the scripture says in Psalm 119, 105. He says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. See, as we read the scriptures, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to understand it and then hear him and obey. It's only when we take the scriptures and we begin to study it and we ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand it that we can be led by him. Bible scholars call, call this process illumination. That's being able to see the word so that it might be light for us to know where we are to go. Without the scriptures and without, without studying the words of God, you will be uh, walking around in the dark, not knowing where you're supposed to go and what God requires of you. This kind of leads me to my last point, and that is that we need to pursue a life led by his word. Pursue a life that's led by his word. Jesus once shared a parable, and in Mark chapter 4, the parable is all about a farmer who takes seeds, and he casts these seeds out onto the ground, and the seeds go and fall in different spaces. And I'm going to summarize this parable of this story because he explains that the, only the seed that falls on good soil grows up and produces fruit. All of the other seeds that fall in other directions or all in other places do not produce fruit. He explains in this parable that one of the seeds falls on thorny ground. And what happens is, is that seed begins to sprout up and then it's choked out by all the thorns. And then later on in that chapter, you can, uh, you can look it up uh, in Mark chapter 4. For those of you online, somebody type in Mark chapter 4. You can see that he describes what's happening here. Look at what he says in Mark 4, 19. The deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. That's what happens when we get so stuck into stuff of the world. If only we would spend the same amount of energy and effort that we do looking at and learning about stuff on YouTube, on Instagram, on some of these social media platforms. Some of that stuff can be really educational, but if we spent the same amount of time studying God's word to a point that we can now begin to hear and obey what he has to say, it would then begin to change your life. You'll hear from him and then begin to move out doing what he calls us to do. See, God wants us to pursue a lifestyle where we're studying his word, taking it in, hearing what he has to say, and then moving out in obedience. And it's only through that that we'll begin to become fruitful. That's his design and desire for us, that we would pursue a life that's led by his word. Look at these last few scriptures. In verse 19, he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. We see here that his rebuke is really motivated by love. He is... He is calling on the church to wake up. He's calling on the church to be revived. He wants to see revival in the relationship between himself and us. And he says, I'm disciplining you because I love you. I want you to wake up to the fact that I love you and I want an intimate relationship with you. He gives this description of him standing at the door and knocking. Some of you all may be seeing some pictures of that. 
And oftentimes it's translated the wrong way or, or they probably, probably try to make it sound like this is evangelistic in nature. This is not about Jesus knocking on the door of the hearts of someone who's not saved. Jesus is standing at the door knocking, trying to get into the church. The church had moved Jesus outside of the walls. And they had been practicing their faith, but Jesus was not at the head of the table. He's knocking on the door of his church saying, listen, individually to each of you, I'm here. Will you let me in? His design and desire is that he would take his rightful place at the head of the table as the head of the church. That we would be intimately involved with him, that we would love him and that he would love us and that we would pursue desires of faith, that we would stay, stay pure and righteous before him, that we would live a life hearing and obeying his word. He says, if you do this, I'm going to just come in and I'm going to sit down and eat with you. Now, here's the key thing is this word eat is actually the word dine. The way that they would eat in the East is a little bit different. They, they did have three meals a day, but the first meal was just usually a piece of bread, maybe dipped in sauce, and they would head on out. The second meal of the day was something like a sandwich that they would eat on the go. But the third meal of the day was where you would prepare a meal, where you would dine with your family. So to invite somebody into your home was an intimate thing. It's still that way today. That a full course meal would be prepared. And that Greek word when he says, come in and I'll come in and eat with you is where he's saying, no, that's where I can intimately get involved with you. That I can sit at the head of your table and I would be in fellowship with you and we'll commune together. And this passion and desire and this love that I have for you, God, will be, re will be revived. That's what he's saying. Will you step out on faith? Will you allow him to see what's in your cup? Start dealing with that stuff. Will you live by his word so that you can hear and obey? And if you do that, you're answering the door and Jesus steps in at the table and will commune with you in fellowship. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God, for your word. God, we thank you for the letter that you wrote to the church at Laodicea, God, because we are that church too in many respects. God, we ask that you would just help us to repent, meaning to go in another direction, to run in the direction of that door, open it up and allow you to come into our lives again. And God, you would give us a fresh anointing of your spirit and we might sense your presence. God, we ask that you would move by your spirit on us today so that today might be a new day where we sup with you. God, we ask this in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want you to stand on your feet. We're going to worship the Lord. I want to come back and give you an opportunity to respond. Hey, Church Online family. Thanks for watching Central's YouTube channel. But don't stop. I want to invite you to be a part of our online community. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream and share it with friends. If you'd like to partner with our ministry, go to our website and click on the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Christ. And we wanna connect with you. You can fill out a connect card on our website under new here. Thanks so much for watching and God bless.